Let's look at some background that's essential for understanding how evolutionary developmental biologists have tried to understand how multicellularity evolved from unicellularity. In other words, ancestors, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of years ago, were single-celled organisms like bacteria or amoebae. And at some point, the ability of those cells to get together and function in a collective body to produce a multicellular organism like humans evolved. So how did that happen? And that's what we're here to talk about today. So briefly, we'll talk about the evolution of multicellularity in terms of the principles and concepts, talk about the concepts of cooperation and cheating of individual cells in the context of a multicellular organism, and then I'll introduce you to the model organism Dictyostelium, the genus Dictyostelium. So taking a step back, multicellularity, a single organism like a human, created of multiple cells, requires those cells to cooperate with each other, to get along with each other, and to communicate with each other. And that transition from being a single-celled organism to being a multicellular organism, one individual cell in the context of a number of cells, has some costs and benefits. And one of the main costs is that in a multicellular organism, specifically in sexually reproducing species, before becoming a multicellular organism, each single cell was evolutionarily highly fit in the sense that the meaning of life basically is that organisms reproduce and pass their genes on to future generations. And from the evolutionary context, the organisms, the individuals that are better able to pass their DNA on to future generations are deemed the most fit. And that's because their the organisms that can reproduce most, their DNA is present more in the future generation. And eventually their DNA might completely overtake the DNA that's being passed on from other individuals in the population. So that is how evolutionary biologists define the most fit organisms in a sense, who can pass their DNA on to the most offspring in the next generation. The other lineages, of organisms that aren't able to reproduce as frequently then go extinct eventually, and that is why they're deemed to be less fit. So in the context of the evolution of multicellularity, individual organisms, individual cells that reproduce, typically asexually, say by cell division, one cell divides and becomes two independent one cell organisms, every single cell has the ability to pass on its DNA to the next generation and to be at least some measurable level of fit. When multicellularity evolves, that means in sexually reproducing species, some cells in the body become somatic cells. They contribute to the organism. They do something for the organism. But they essentially give up the opportunity to pass their DNA on to next to the future generations. It's only the germline cells in a multicellular reprodu sexually reproducing organism that have the ability to pass their DNA on. So that's essentially a cost. The evolution from single cells to multicellular organisms means that some cells have to give up their opportunity to themselves reproduce and pass their DNA on. So that's the main cost. In terms of benefits, there are a number of benefits potentially of multicellularity, including a division of labor, which also accompanies specialization or the ability to produce a complex organism. A single cell organism probably can't have eyes and a sense of smell and a sense of taste and a sense of touch and a sense of hearing. They can in certain ways, but the ability to be a complex organism in terms of systems and anatomy and senses and capabilities comes with the opportunity of having many cells and then many different cell types. So the big question is how, in terms of genetics and molecular biology, can multicellularity evolve? What has to happen in the DNA and in the molecules of the organism for a single cell organism to be able to become 
multicellular. So first, as I mentioned, some cells have to be ordered to evolutionarily die, to give up their opportunity to reproduce and become somatic tissues. And for cells to be able to accept orders or to give orders means they have to be able to communicate with each other. So cell-cell interactions, physical interactions and the communication that takes place between physically adjacent cells or nearby cells is probably critical for the evolution of multicellularity. So we'll go briefly through a couple of examples of cell-cell communication, just to give you a flavor for how this might work. In one sense, one of the earliest studies or sets of studies to measure cell-cell communication involved eye development. And in this case, what happens is in a developing organism, this could be basically any developing organism has an eye, any vertebrate, fish, a reptile, an amphibian, a mammal, there are cells, the optic vesicle, that send signals to ectoderm, which would be the outer layer of cells in the developing embryo. And if those cells are competent, that means if those cells are able to accept or receive a signal that's given off by the optic vesicle, what the optic vesicle does is it does not become the eye, it signals the ectoderm to start developing the eye. And so in this case, it's the lens that is being indicated here that is starting to develop because these cells in the optic vesicle are signaling the ectoderm, hey, this area of the body is supposed to start turning into a lens at this point in development. And I've indicated here that that's based on fibroblast growth factor eight signaling from the optic vesicle. And briefly, We've already introduced the concepts of necessity and sufficiency. So this figure also shows examples of how those experiments work. To demonstrate the necessity of the optic cup to produce eyes, scientists experimentally removed the optic vesicle, say from half of an organism. Right? So from the right side of the organism, they get rid of those cells and they find that no eye develops. That means that those cells were necessary for eye development. At the same time, they can also move the optic vesicle to another part of the organism. And although this does not show that the optic vesicle is sufficient, this particular experiment showed that if you move the optic vesicle somewhere else in a developing embryo, that doesn't necessarily cause eye development because, so the optic vesicle isn't sufficient because the ectoderm, the cells that are being signaled to by the optic vesicle, have to be competent. Those cells have to be able to receive that FGFA signal. And it turns out that only certain cells in the ectoderm are capable of receiving the signal. So as usual, communication involves two individuals or two partners, right? There's the sender and the receiver, and both have to be able to communicate in order for signaling to work effectively. So that's one form of cell-cell communication and interaction. Another example, you may have already seen before, this is more in detail, the same idea, but looking at the molecular level in terms of how signaling works. And in this case, this is one of the paracrine signaling pathways, the hedgehog pathway, where a protein hedgehog is produced by neighboring cells and then sent out into the intercellular space from the signaling cell. And any cells that have the receptor for that protein hedgehog, in this case, the receptor is a protein called patch, can bind to the signal and that causes an intracellular cascade of events that changes gene expression. So in the evolution of multicellularity from single celled organisms, a lot of changes have to take place in that single cell. It has to evolve the abilities to either send signals to other cell cells and or it also has to start having proteins expressed that receive signals from other cells and translate those signals into things like changes in gene expression. So it is really hard to imagine, although it, it's true that multicellularity did evolve, it's really hard to imagine the vast number of changes that would have to take place for a single cell organism to evolve the ability to communicate to other cells to send signals to them, to receive signals, 
and to respond appropriately. One of the problems with the evolution of multicellularity is the concept of cheater cells. And that's the concept that in a multicellular organism, some cells, well, all cells presumably benefit from being part of the whole organism. But what happens if some mutations in particular cells allow them to receive that benefit because they are part of the body of the organism, but that remove their ability to contribute to the organism? They become essentially parasitic cells. They don't do anything useful for the organism, but they still benefit from the organism, maybe to its detriment, in fact, which is why I refer to them as parasitic cells. And based on some theory work in the field, the prediction is that in asexually reproducing populations, cheating cells can proliferate. Once one arises, it will spread through a population when it reproduces asexually. So that's an important thing to keep in mind for the study that we're going to talk about. Now, in terms of research difficulties, in terms of measuring and testing what are the genetic changes that allow the evolution of multicellularity? A problem in studying cheating cells and their role in the process is that any mutations that generate cheating cells tend to be lethal, sort of by definition, that if you want to study cheating, you have to find a system in which you can have cheating cells in an organism that actually allow the organism still to survive so you can actually study the organism and the effects of those cheating cells. And one of the reasons that social amoeba, in this case, Dictyostelium discoidium, the species, which is a group of individual, group of individuals, a group of species that are generally colloquially referred to as slime molds, are useful because it's in this species that scientists have, in a group of species, that scientists have identified that you can have cheating cells and propagate them without killing the organism. Let's talk about slime molds and dictyostelium in particular. So this is a very diverse group of species. And these slime molds, including dictyostelium, are typically single cell amoebas or amoebae. It's Latin, so amoeba is feminine, singular amoebae, A-E at the end is feminine, plural. Those individual amoeba will aggregate together into larger groups, which are what you see in these pictures, under particular conditions, typically high density and starvation conditions. So on their own, the amoebas crawl around on surfaces and eat bacteria, essentially. They engulf them and use the bacteria as energy sources. And when the food runs out or when there are too many individual amoeba nearby, the individual amoeba group together into these groups that look like single individuals. They act like single individuals, but they are actually composed of many hundreds, thousands of individual amoebas that work together. So slime molds then are thought to be an important transitionary species or set of species to study to understand how individual cells can learn, evolve, to coordinate with each other and to communicate with each other for what seem to be beneficial purposes for the entire group. I mentioned that typically there's a single cell stage where individual cells are called amoeba and they act as individual cells. They move independently, they engulf bacteria, their food, but when the population reaches a particular density when there's a lot of crowding of individuals relative to the amount of food, starvation, then cells will start sending out signals to each other, chemical signals, that cause all of the individual amoeba in an area to group together. So they follow those chemical signals to a single point where all of these individuals accumulate and they become one mass of cells, which eventually is referred to as a slug. And that slug moves around the substrate as a group. All of these individual cells act together to migrate, essentially. It seems like the purpose of the slug is to move somewhere where there might be more food. And 
if the slug at some point doesn't find any food, then the slug will basically turn into a blob. That blob will extend a fruiting body to the tip of what's referred to as a stalk. So a number of these cells turn into this structure that holds aloft up in the air, cells that turn into spores. The hardy, long-lived spores that can be dispersed. So for example, one thought is that the stalk is important to lift the spores up high enough that they might be caught by the wind or by a passing insect or something else that will distribute them somewhere else where there might be more food. And those individual spores then can turn back into our amoeba. When they land, if there's food, they turn back into amoeba, they eat the bacteria and the life cycle repeats. So in a single, basically, developmental cycle, we go from individuals, individual cells that act as individuals, to a multicellular organism that turns back into single cells. So this is the system that authors use in part to study what happens if cheating cells evolve in this population of amoeba. So here's how cheating comes into the uh, question. All of these cells individually, the amoeba, are able to reproduce. But when starvation occurs and the stalk and the spores, the, the cup at the top of the stalk are formed, all of these amoeba that form the stalk are essentially giving up their ability to reproduce. Somehow, these cells are convinced that they should be somewhat like somatic tissues, that they are supporting cells, and they essentially evolutionarily die. They give up their right to reproduce and pass their DNA on. It's only the cells that climb all the way up to the top that become spores that are going to be evolutionary, evolutionarily successful and pass their DNA on to future generations of cells. So this is the real question is, how does this process work? How is it, what sort of signaling is going on between cells that can convince some of the cells to become stock cells, differentiate? In other words, is the big question. How does cellular differentiation work here so that some cells become for, uh, spores and other cells become stock and somatic cells? So a few of the events that probably need to happen in slime molds in this transition from individual amoeba way in the past to what we have at present, which is where amoeba, individual amoeba are individuals, but now they're able to communicate with each other to form things like this slug. One of the things that would probably have to evolve is the ability for individual amoeba to produce that cellular signal, cyclic AMP, when there's high density, low nutrient conditions. So there has to be the evolution of signaling. There also has to be then the evolution of other amoeba being able to respond to cyclic AMP signals to allow all of those individual amoeba to congregate together to form a slug. So then other probable transitionary events would include the cells being able to adhere to each other. So there's probably some gene expression and protein expression changes that allow those individual cells, hundreds or thousands of them shown here, in what acts like an individual, but is really a mixture of, again, hundreds or thousands of individual amoebae working together, they have to stick together. The slug itself also is known to be able to orient itself into chemotax, so to move towards particular stimuli, like food sources, like bacteria. So that's actually a benefit of multicellularity is an individual amoeba, a tiny little cell, probably can't sense which side of its body it is smelling, if it has a sense of smell, it's detecting signals of bacteria. But a slug having polarity, an anterior and a posterior, has the ability to detect gradients because cells at the front that are closer to a signal might detect that signal more strongly than cells at the back that are farther away. And that sense of gradient of signaling might give that multicellular slug the ability to tell, to orient itself and tell which direction it should move to either avoid 
a queue or to approach a queue. And then there's some other um, potential transitionary events as well, like these cells are all held together on the outside by a cellulose sheet. So the cells on the surface of the slug need to produce that cellulose, but not all of the cells that are inside the slug. So again, that's an event that requires some signaling. Cells need to know where they are in the context of the temporarily multicellular organism. So back to the idea of cheating, now that we've taken a quick look at dictyostelium and the life cycle and the potential events leading to multicellularity. What would a cheater look like? Well, it might be a mutation that allows some amoeba to move faster or slower than others in that situation where starvation occurs and all of the cells migrate to a particular point and become part of the slug. Because maybe where in the slug you are matters. So in related events that might enable cheating would be causing individual amoeba to respond differently to extracellular signals. That is, maybe ignoring a signal would help you be part of the body, but not sacrifice yourself for the greater good. And likewise, maybe cheater amoebas can send false extracellular signals that deceive their surrounding counterparts, that allow those cheaters to stay part of the body of the organism, the slug, but, and get the benefits of being part of that multicellular organism, but not have to do any work themselves. So those are just some hypothetical ideas to keep in mind as we proceed through this topic. I already described in words and in pictures this process. But again, there's a slug, and that slug is created, composed of multiple individual cells. And you can ignore the labels on the pictures. It's just pictures of a slug, and then the stalk and the germ cells that are created between the upper cup and the lower cup. So all of these cells that are shown in color become sort of the somatic cells. They're structural cells. They won't become spores. And it's known that cells that are present in different parts of the slug become those different structures. So it really does matter where in the slug you are, because if you're in particular areas of the slug, that essentially destines you to be giving up your ability to become a spore because you are destined to become somatic tissue, the stalk, the lower cup, the upper cup, and the basal disc. So where you are in the slug really does matter. And that's one of the reasons that potentially mutations that allow cells either to ignore signals that might tell them which sort of somatic tissue to become, or signals that tell them where in the slug to be. If you can ignore those, if there were signals that said you should go to the front of the slug, and a cheater was able to ignore that, and it was able to stay in the back of the slug, it would have probably a better chance of becoming a spore, rather than giving up its ability to be a spore by being destined to become somatic structure. So aside from the fact that dictyostelium has this single cell and multi-cell aspect to its life cycle, it's also useful likewise because it alternates between clonal reproduction and sexual reproduction. And you can also perform experimental evolution on dicti, as it's called, because these are small organisms that are easily cultured in the laboratory and can be grown in large numbers. So in terms of the concept of experimental evolution, on one hand, it's pretty straightforward. Evolution is particularly hard to study a lot of the time because a lot of organisms have long life cycles and they don't produce many offspring. And if you want to see evolution in the lifetime of the researcher, a human researcher, you need to study an organism that has fast life cycles. And that increases the probability that particular mutations, which happen at random, might actually be observed by the experimenter. So we need organisms that have, like I just mentioned, fast life cycles and lots of offspring. That basically just increases the probability that individual mutations that would have a phenotypic effect will occur and then be able to be observed by a scientist. 
And that's the concept of experimental evolution, is instead of allowing evolution to happen in nature, which is hard to control the environment and other variables, scientists bring these usually um, microorganisms or small organisms like Drosophila or Cenorhabditis worms into the laboratory, grow them in large numbers, and carefully control conditions, as it indicates in this first bullet point, to control for almost everything except for a few conditions, typically population size and the number of individuals that are used to found each additional generation of the population. So those are typical approaches in experimental evolution. We use small organisms that have lots of offspring, grow multiple individual distinct lines, populations of organisms, treat some of them in one way, treat other replicate lines in a controlled manner. So you have an experimental set and a control set, each with multiple replicates, and you vary those other variables. And the idea behind growing each of these control lines for multiple generations, 10 generations, 100 generations, 1,000 generations, is simply to allow enough time for those random mutations to occur naturally. So we don't induce mutations. We don't mutagenize these lines typically. We just let them grow in the laboratory letting those natural mutations occur. And then we can assess experimentally how evolution proceeds by looking for things like whether evolution occurs, how frequently it occurs. If we have multiple different independent lines growing, independent populations of organisms, we could ask how many times, what's the frequency with which a particular trait evolves under these conditions. And we can also ask things like when, at what generation number, for example, do traits start to evolve? Does it take 10 generations, 100 generations, 1,000 generations for a particular trait or adaptation to occur? And if it takes 1,000 generations in one line, is it consistently 1,000 or so generations in multiple lines? Or does the time it takes to evolve a particular trait appear random? It occurs quickly in some lines and takes much longer in other lines or populations. In this particular study, in this paper, there are basically two different conditions in which the scientists work. In one, which is the low relatedness condition, in which they're growing dictyostelium that are not very closely genetically related to each other, that low relatedness condition is caused by uh, having a large population size. So growing lots and lots and lots and lots of dictyostelium in the same petri dish, in the same location. And when that happens, even though all of those dictyostelium originate from a single celled ancestor who replicates and replicates and replicates and creates the large population, the fact that the dictyostelium are growing in the context of a large population means that because there are many generations of growth from a single ancestor to a large population, all of the individual dictyostelium amoebae at generation 20, let's say, aren't actually that genetically related to each other because they have an ancestor 20 or 30 or 40 generations back in their lineage. That's contrasted with the mutation accumulation experiments, which not coincidentally is also a high relatedness condition. And that is because the population sizes are small. So we don't have very many individuals that are being grown at a time. And every generation, a single individual is picked from a population to found the next generation of dictyostelium. So what that means is every generation, there is a single individual that's the most recent common ancestor. So all of its offspring are very closely genetically related to each other. And one of them is picked to found the next generation of dictyostelium. And so every generation in this sort of an approach on the right, every individual is essentially a brother or sister to everybody else in the population. And so down at the bottom of this table, that's why in the low relatedness condition, theory predicts that cheating will evolve because it's known in lots of species in nature that it tends to be individuals or cells that are very closely related to each other that tend to cooperate. And when you have individuals that are less distantly or more distantly related to each other, 
less related to each other, they tend not to cooperate as much. So in the conditions of mutation accumulation, which is the same as a high relatedness situation with small populations and single individual bottlenecks, which is what this is called, a single individual founds the next population. So we go from a large population to a single individual. And that's why it's called a bottleneck. Then that individual produces another large population of individuals and then one is selected. So the population side decreases to one again, bottlenecking. In this condition, we don't expect mutation or cheating to evolve because every generation, all of the individuals are very closely related to each other. They're more likely it's predicted to cooperate with each other. It's less likely for cheating to exist. There are a couple other experimental details here. In this particular paper, in the large populations, there were 31 generations of growth and the replication was 24 populations. So they had 24 different populations of dictyostelium growing at the same time for 31 generations with no population bottleneck, which means they took lots and lots and lots of individuals from one generation to produce the next generation in each of those 24 lines over 31 generations. On the other hand, in the mutation accumulation with a single individual bottleneck, they grew each of 90 lines, so 90 independent populations of dictyostelium growing for 70 generations, moving one individual every generation to found the next generation of each of those 90 lines 70 times. It's just a lot of work. And this is the experimental evolution approach. So again, to summarize, in low relatedness populations where large populations are grown without bottlenecks, the authors predict that cheating will evolve. And in the mutation accumulation or high relatedness lines where there are small population sizes and only a single individual bottleneck from generation to generation, they don't expect cheating to evolve. So in that low relatedness population, you have a large number of individuals in generation one, and a large number of them are used to found the next generation. So in generation two, those are the initial individuals, and then over time, they reproduce to produce another large population. And then a large number of those are passaged to generate the third generation, and over time, those individuals reproduce and so on. So that's what's happening in the low relatedness population. So over time, not only does mutation occur every generation in some of these organisms, but they also only shared common ancestors way back in the beginning of the experiment. So by the 30th generation, or however many generations this experiment runs, each of the individuals in a population is very distantly related to each other, are very distantly related to each other. In contrast, we can start with the same size population in generation one of the mutation accumulation experiment, but a single individual is moved to found the next population, which means that all of these individuals now are very closely related to each other relative to what was happening over here, where each of these individuals is a descendant of one of five or six in this drawing individuals. So here now we have cousins, maybe second cousins, and every generation in the low relatedness population, individuals become more and more genetically unrelated to each other. With this bottlenecking, picking a single individual every generation and using it to found a new population, that means that every generation, all of those individuals have a single ancestor from the previous generation. So every generation, all of, the all of the individuals in the population are closely related to each other. So cheating is more likely to happen in the left scenario because all of the individuals are less related to each other. And there's more opportunity for a cheater to exist sort of undetected in the population. If cheating evolves over here on the right, because all the individuals are closely related to each other, if there's a mutation that's important for cheating, and it happens to be the organism that has that mutation that's selected to found the next population, then all of these individuals would have the cheating mutation. And if everybody's a cheater, nobody wins because nobody's actually doing the work of the organism, the multicellular organism. 
and in the case of Dictyostelium, if these were all cheaters, if they all were cheating in the sense that they were all going to become spores, then none of those cells in that population would become the stock. And so none of the spores would get dispersed anywhere and they would never find food and they would essentially go extinct, that population. So cheating is more likely to both evolve, arise, and also exist and subsist to stay around from generation to generation in large populations. But in this mutation accumulation approach, it's very unlikely to evolve. And if it does evolve, it's likely to kill that population because everyone's a cheater and no one's doing the work. So the way that the authors can tell if they have experimentally evolved a cheating line or found a cheating individual in a population is they take, this is another power of Dictyostelium, is you can grow the original population. You can just keep it growing without undergoing either of these two experimental conditions, the large population size or the small population size experimental and control conditions. So you have the ancestor maybe frozen in a freezer so it's not evolving itself, it's just in stasis waiting for you to do this sort of analysis that the authors do. They take the ancestor, the pre-experimental evolution original amoebas, they take 50% of those originals and they mix an equal number of cells from one of the experimentally evolved strains. So they mix them together, they put them on a petri dish. And then when those populations of amoeba starve and they produce the fruiting bodies, then the authors simply collect the spores and they ask if, like the original population of individual amoebas, when you look at the spore, when you look at the fruiting body and which cells became the cells that were chosen to go on to found the next generation, are, is the same ratio, 50-50, ancestral cells and experimentally evolved cells found in the spores. If it's exactly the same, then there's been no evolution. There are no cheaters. If among the spores, there are more of the experimentally evolved cells than the ancestral cells. That means that that experimental evolution process evolved cheaters. Somehow they are cheating their way into becoming spores. They're more represented than the ancestors were in this 50-50 mixture. On the other hand, you could also have the situation where the experimentally evolved cells are found less frequently in the spores than are the ancestral cells. And if that's the case, then the experimentally evolved cells have evolved to be cheated. And the ancestor is the cheater. So to draw that out, we can have some ancestral amoebas and we can have the experimentally evolved amoebas. So with time going left to right, when there's no cheating, initially the authors mixed together, let's say eight ancestral cells that had not undergone the experimental evolution process. These were the starting cells for experimental evolution. And they also add in eight, I think that was eight, maybe nine, who knows, equal number of the experimentally evolved cells. And then they let them starve and they'll produce the stock and the cup. And the authors look in the spores and they want to see if there are an equal number, so here I'm just drawing four and four, an equal number that's representative of the original mixture of cells have become spores. And so then the other four of each of those cells have given up their ability to become spores and they become stock cells. This is an example of not cheating. The particular population of cells is no more or less likely to be found in the spores than in the rest of the organism. If experimental evolution has led to cheating, we start with the same mixture, 50-50, half blue, half black, half experimentally evolved, half ancestral. And if the blue cells have evolved cheating, if during that experimental evolution process, some mutations have occurred that let those cells do whatever we talked about earlier, ignore signals, send their own signals, move faster, 
locate to a particular part of the slug, then when we look at that stock and cup, we would expect to see maybe six of the blue cells and only two of the black cells, the original cells, become spores. And so overrepresented in the stock, the somatic tissue is the ancestral cells and overrepresented in the spores is the experimentally evolved set of cells. So the simple counting of cells and where they come from, which population they came from, is how the authors can measure whether or not they have evolved in any of their hundreds of different replicate lines um, cheating. 